Well, first of all, a big thank you to uh, the NSDA, especially to Charlie and to Kim and others. Uh, it's very nice to see a lot of familiar faces here. And my uh, object here in a few minutes is to try to set the table a little bit for the day. And uh, it has to be kind of fast, it has to be kind of general. And uh, you will probably hear as we go along that there are a few controversies or slight differences of, of uh, opinion or philosophy. And so there may be a little rearranging of the, uh, the table setting as we go along. But just to get us started with a fairly uh, unified uh, overview is my job. The uh, thing we're talking about spasmodic dystonia is really a dystonia. It's in the family of dystonias, and dys means abnormal, and tonia refers to the tone of muscles. And it's an uncommon neurological disorder, and it's marked by either intermittent or sustained muscle contractions that are involuntary, and sometimes a combination of some intermittent and sustained. It has no effect, thankfully, on general health or longevity. And it's chronic, unfortunately, and unremitting once it's established, but it does sometimes evolve, so it will change a little bit over time. It's treated, uh, typically, uh, with a combination of oral medications, sometimes therapy of various sorts, or surgery. Now, types of dystonia, there is generalized dystonia where a person has this abnormal tone of muscles that can affect virtually the entire body. And that's generalized dystonia. And then there are regional or segmental, sometimes they're, they're sliced and diced in different ways, but the idea that a section of the body or say some various muscles, the eyes, the jaw, the neck, that kind of thing, that would be a regional or a segmental kind of dystonia. And then there is focal dystonia or localized dystonia, and that includes spasmodic dysphonia. So spasmodic dysphonia is a uncommon neurological disorder of muscle tone and spasms and abnormal tone, and it's a focal dystonia. Well, here's a formal de definition now putting it all together. A focal form of dystonia a neurological, not psychological, but a neurological voice disorder that involves involuntary spasms, and I say spasms because sometimes it's a sustained muscle contraction more than an actual spasm, and it causes interruptions of the voice or an abnormal voice quality. Sometimes the voice is not actually interrupted. So SD can cause the voice to break up or have a tight, strained, or whispery quality. Now back to this um, general, this big classification, if you look at the bottom, uh, there are two varieties that I think are useful to distinguish because it's the source of a lot of misdiagnosis or missed diagnosis, is the difference between a, what I call a tonic variant of SD, which is more of the sustained kind of muscle contraction, or the erratic and intermittent which is the more classic form of spasmodic dysphonia. So I think it's useful to keep those kinds of things in mind. Well, focal dystonia examples, just to, I'm giving you these examples because I can do some visual things that will help you understand what's then happening in the larynx. So ocular dystonia is another focal dystonia. Somebody here may have also ocular dystonia, often called blepharospasm, and it has two main variants. One is a squint, which is the more sustained kind of thing, and the other is the intermittent, where you see a lot of blinking. And so blepharospasm would be another focal dystonia. Cervical neck dystonia, where you could have a sort of sustained posturing abnormality without a lot of movement, and like, uh, like this, or you can have a variant where there's a lot of continuous movements at the same time. So there's kind of a tonic and a, and a classic variant of cervical dystonia, and then writer's cramp is, would be a limb dystonia where the 
arm, let's say, the dominant arm might be affected by spasms that are involuntary that interfere with writing or, or other activities. And then we get to laryngeal dystonia, um, which is, typically we use the terms laryngeal dystonia and spasmodic dystonia interchangeably, and that's because about 95% of people with laryngeal dystonia manifest as spasmodic dysphonia, and the remaining manifest as a respiratory dystonia. Well, what are some general characteristics uh, of all the dystonias, actually in all sites, is it can seem psychogenic, and it's really, for experienced clinicians, it's the only thing in the differential diagnosis, is, is this psychogenic? And it's usually very easy to distinguish between psychogenic and neurogenic. And so some people are very bothered that they think they have a psychological disorder because of what they've been told elsewhere or because they notice the stress uh, uh, you know, worsening. But it is not psychogenic, it is neurogenic uh, uh, disorder. It can be confusingly task-specific, and this is a, another bedeviling thing for people with dystonia because we look for patterns. You know, when, when people first develop SD, they look for patterns because they figure, naturally, humanly, we figure that if we can discern a pattern in what makes the voice better or worse, then we can start to introduce some control. We can start to manage it. And so, but it's confusingly task specific. So for example, uh, with the uh, arm, you might have someone with a limb dystonia who can comb his hair, he can swing a golf club, he can button his coat, no problem, but the minute he picks up a pen to try to write his name, then the, the spasms begin. So it's like really task specific in some people and um, very much so in the voice as well. Sensory tricks are the idea that you can do things that inhibit the spasms. And again, it's a, it's a little bit bedeviling to patients because they notice these things and they want to harness them and, and thereby take control. Uh, example might be someone who's got a, a cervical dystonia and their head is like this and you say, John, can you, can you straighten your head? And John struggles to straighten and he just can't do it and he just keeps moving like this. And so you tap on his forehead and John can look straight ahead, he can look up, he can look left. I'm exaggerating a little bit probably, but he can look right as long as you tap on his forehead and the minute you stop tapping on his forehead, over he goes again and, and goes into his dystonic postures. So those sensory tricks, the task specificity, the variation is bedeviling and in, uh, to people with the disorder. There's a lot of variability that can be spontaneous. A person can have a good sentence and then a bad sentence. They can have a good word and a bad word, a good paragraph and a bad paragraph, a good half day and a bad half day, sort of a good week and a bad week. They, they can have these sort of cycles of, of variation. And so they're thinking about their diet and they're wondering about weather and allergies and, you know, because they want to know, well, what is that about? That it's, it was better last week. And, and it's bedeviling because unfortunately it's just part of the disorder. It's just, it just is. It's just the way it is with the disorder. And um, there's also some long-term evolution. We have people who have had adductory spasmodic dysonia for years and then they develop abductor. I have a couple who've made an almost complete switch from one to the other. So it can evolve. It's not very common. Uh, people can add tremor where they didn't really have any at first. So there can be this evolution. And it can evolve in your favor. So especially, at least a lot of my Botox patients, many years in, they seem to be getting a little milder. Well, how is it diagnosed? It's the patient's story, so it's the description of what the voice does that it shouldn't do and what it won't do that it should do. It's the aberrations and the limitations that description from a patient is highly suggestive. Then it's the voice characteristics and primarily elicited vocal phenomenology uh, is powerful. I think personally it's the most powerful tool, elicited vocal phenomenology. And then it's the laryngeal examination, which is simply confirmatory, not really uh, very diagnostic by itself. And you notice that 
though there would be some controversy here, I'm sure, from other speakers, I personally don't think there's a role for anything else in making the diagnosis besides the history, the elicited vocal phenomenology, and laryngeal examination. That's it. That's how you de determine it. Well, typical history, I'm, I think you can read faster than I can say all of these things. So if you just kind of read through these unremitting voice catches, variability, hate the telephone, difficult sounds, easier to sing less. So those are the kind of typical history. And then phenomenology is phonatory arrests. Uh, let me just, uh, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to just illustrate those with my own voice. It's far faster than finding samples of patients. So phonatory arrests would be long ago, oh, people found that it was easier. That's a phonatory arrest, the voice just stops. And abductory is long ago, people found, where it just drops away to a whisper, it drops to nothing. And then squeeze downs are where it's not classically a phonatory arrest, but it's long ago, people found that it was easier, where, it, where it's squeezing down, but not actually stopping, squeeze downs. And then some people have just strained. Long ago, people found that it was easier. You're not hearing any squeeze downs particularly, nor are you hearing phonatory arrests, but you're hearing this strain that's very continuous. That would be a tonic variant. And intermittent or continuous whispers. So long ago, people found that it was easier to travel, like that kind of thing. And sometimes it's more continuous because it's a more tonic variant. Long ago, people found that it was easier, where well, it just sounds like the person's kind of whispering. And some people even have what I call inhibitory spasms, where they will have this kind of breaking to, to a sort of a laughing kind of a sound like that. It's almost like they suddenly lost the tone in their thyroarytenoid muscles, in their vocal fold muscles. And then there's tremor, and it's dystonic tremor, not essential tremor, but dystonic tremor, which is marked by interruptions and by variability of amplitude and uh, frequency. So it's an e that's a dystonic tremor where it's interrupted, like a motor, a car motor that is kind of faltering every now and again as opposed to an essential tremor, which is far more regular in amplitude, in frequency, and doesn't have the interruptions. And if it's respiratory dystonia, so maybe there are one or two people, uh, st statistically here, with some respiratory involvement, you'll hear breathing noises either breathing in, so you'll hear this, I'll make it a little uh, obvious more than it usually is, but you'll hear this, <laughs> So it's a segmentation of the inflow of air, or it's a, a involuntary breath holding. So it can be on the in, or it can be on the out. So you can have this, <laughs> like that, like it's bursting out in little uh, pieces. Well, other phenomenology, more general phenomenology, is again this task specificity. Uh, people will say, I sing and it's not anywhere near as bad or it's not bad at all. I'm normal as I sing. So anything like that. Accents, people can put on a fake British accent and it's like their, their symptoms are dramatically less. Or they'll do a sort of a sing-songy voice, especially in kind of a high pitch. Or they'll say, I'm really affected in my, my chest voice. I'm highly affected. But if I speak in my falsetto, there are no spasms at all. So there's a registration issue. And there's what, uh, what we call cognitive loading, an E, which is just a sustained uh, sound. There's no thought that goes into that. It's very cognitively unloaded, and that's my term. And so that tends to be less affected. Uh, reciting something that you know by heart that you don't have to think about. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. That's very cognitively unloaded. But standing in front of a group like this, where I'm thinking about what I'm saying, and I'm looking at reactions, and I'm wondering if I'm a little late on time, am I going too long? And you know that's what I call cognitive loading. So the more layers, it's like the more windows open in, on, the hard, on the hard drive, the worse it is. And so sp spasms tend to get much worse with a lot of cognitive loading. Sensory tricks we talked about earlier, stress and fatigue, this is a major bugaboo because, again, people 
think, well, if I notice always that with stress and fatigue it gets worse, then shouldn't I explore that end of things. Well, maybe you should if you're a high stress person and, and you know, if there are other reasons. But if you make the transfer to say, well, because that stress and fatigue makes things worse, then it must be a, st a stress fatigue kind of disorder, you're making a terrible mistake. Don't go there because you just add baggage that is nasty baggage. You know, you want to understand that if I had diabetes or if I had high blood pressure, stress and fatigue might put both of those two things out of whack. You know, if I had a dial on my forehead that, that you could read a number representing my blood pressure, you know, and you'd notice, hey, his, it's pretty high right now, and you wouldn't say, well, therefore, his high blood pressure is a stress disorder. You'd say, no, stress and fatigue affect the, the symptoms of his, or the, the, the manifestation or the severity, but it's not a stress and fatigue disorder. So manage stress and fatigue, because we should all do that. But don't make the transfer that you're dealing with a, a psychological disorder. Bad to go there. Well, just a little bit more, and then I'll stop. Um, normal phonation here uh, has this sort of open appearance. You see, right, uh, uh, the vocal folds are quite easily seen uh, during phonation, so this is normal. An adductor spasm, the whole larynx can just clamp down. And, oh dear, what did I do now? <laughs> this isn't my computer, so. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you. That was easy. Whew. So, um, yeah, the number. Do you see the number here? On the <laughs> okay, so an abductory spasm, instead of this up here, uh, during sustained phonation at E, you see a sudden pulling apart of the vocal, fo vocal folds, and that's why there's a burst of air and just kind of a whisper. We're back in business. So just to show you a little idea, just so you have pictures in your head, here would be normal. Uh, And then let's show you uh, classic, just to give you the idea. <laughs> now that's a little more uh, gross but than most people have, but I just wanted to give you the idea. And then abductory, we'll just show you the classic, whoops, that didn't, let's try this one more time. Uh, See up at the top, they're just pulling apart, and it just drops to a whisper. Okay, and then uh, I did the inspiratory spasms, the expiratory spasms, and the mixed. And um, the people with respiratory dystonia usually also have spasmodic dystonia, but there are a few people who have pure respiratory. Their speaking voices are fine. They have absolutely no effect on the phonatory side. The effect is purely on the respiratory side. That's quite rare. but. Um, I think out of 1,500 patients, I have about uh, one or two like that. Well, laryngeal findings are normal other than tiny quivering or major spasms. The treatments, just to, to make a list for you, psychotherapy has been uh, suggested. I personally think it uh, would be only about sort of coping and sort of uh, managing stress, but have nothing to do with actually ridding yourself of the disorder. I think that would be barking up a wrong tree. Medications, oral medications, tend to be more for the, the general and the regional than for the focal. Voice therapy, uh, we can talk for an hour or two about the role of speech therapy, and everyone differs, but I personally think it's for education, it's for support, it's for workplace evaluation, it's for things like that, but it would be a very small number of sessions and not really directed at fixing. Looking for phonatory tricks, looking for 
a task specificity, so you know, as a tool in the pocket, but it's not really, in my experience, a solution. Uh, if the person is misdiagnosed as a psychogenic disorder, it can be amazing. It's like, and sometimes that causes trouble where people think, well, we cured someone with SD, but it was actually someone who had a psychogenic disorder. Botox, I personally think, is still the mainstay, uh, and there's a whole panel on that, and surgery, a whole panel on that. Well, I'll just lay out a few questions and then I'm done. Um, actually, as I think of it, let me just have you sort of read these questions. Oh, here's what I wanted to say. One of the things that we may encounter today, uh, I seem to encounter it in every uh, context like this, is that, look at the thing at the bottom, every treatment works or fails for someone. So uh, that's one of the problems. Uh, you will find someone who had the original uh, recurrent nerve crush many years ago, and they say, my voice is dramatically different as a result of that procedure. I can't, for the life of me, understand why everyone doesn't run and get that procedure done. Somebody else may say, you know, clonopin, it's amazing for me. And I, I go to these support groups, and I'm just so frustrated that everybody doesn't use clonopin. It's like, whoa, what's, what's the problem here? Or noni juice, you know, I drank, started drinking noni juice and it's like ever since then my voice is amazingly better and why doesn't everybody do that? And that's because every single treatment I'm convinced that was ever tried for anyone, there's somebody in the world who says, that did it. Why is that? Because possibly their dystonia evolved, coincident with that. You see, because t dystonia does evolve. And so they are attributing the benefit to the noni juice, but it might have just been a spontaneous thing. It's a great problem because, you know, our belief systems get activated when, when we have this experience that's profound. And then we just want to say to everybody, you repeat my experience. But I just need you to understand that idea that every treatment works for somebody, how, however wild it sounds but every treatment that works for many people fails for some, you see, so that's, that's a problem. And then speech therapy, is it for everyone? What's its role in diagnosis? What's its role in treatment? What's involved? What should we think about the clinicians who claim cure? We should probably talk about that in the panel later. Uh, why are different methods used? Why are results variable? What about risks? Uh, is it true it doesn't work for the AB? Uh, optimal versus suboptimal, you know, sometimes people judge Botox, but they should be judging the quality or the, uh, of their injections more than they should be judging Botox. And what are the reasons for dissatisfaction and what can be done about that? And then the surgery question, what are typical benefits of surgery? Why are results variable? What about risks? What are the pitfalls? And what are the reasons for dissatisfaction? And why do doctors view it differently? So those are just some questions that I would lay out, and I think we'll stop there. I, that's, again, just supposed to be setting the table, and now we can have the panel serve the food or whatever. <laughs> okay, are we, Kim, my understanding is you wanted just to take questions at this point? So brief overview from each of you about uh, what you think in general. So uh, first of all, it does work, okay. I have a tendency of being a little too loud at times, sorry. Uh, I'm blowing out anybody's eardrums. But um, uh, first of all, my name is Seth Daly. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Charlie. And, they yes, can't hear. Oh, you, oh, you they can't, oh, can't hear. The yeah, alternate. So. How about that? <laughs> thank you. So thank you to everybody for sharing your experiences today. I look forward to chatting with all of you. Um, in brief, to me, the single biggest concern that I have for individuals with this disorder is that they never get diagnosed or that they get misdiagnosed. Um, if you can eventually make it to someone who's familiar with the disorder, um, that is probably the biggest step that can be taken. Um, yes, there are uh, risks and there are 
benefits with Botox and alternate strategies, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But honestly, when you, I don't know that this is, I don't know that we have great data on the, the average number of years that someone will have spent uh, without any therapy or any diagnosis. But for all new patients, it's, as you well know, it's months, years, sometimes decades. Um, I recall one patient who had actually been diagnosed, I think, by Dr. Bastian in, in the 1990s, and her husband had actually forbade her from getting Botox, and so she had to wait till he died. Till he <laughs> till not me. <laughs> no, 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 not, not, not till Dr. Bastian died. Till, <laughs> till her. <laughs> The power of the pronoun. Um, <laughs> um, until she, until she ultimately uh, got uh, got Botox therapy. Um, but uh, honestly, the the hardest part is that. Um, so, being able to reach out, okay, as positive vectors to your community, for us as clinicians to be able to be information uh, spreaders, to be uh, resources for people. It's enormously alleviating to know, one, that it's not psychogenic, and number two, that there's a lot of help to be had. And so, honestly, I think that that's probably the biggest service that we can ever provide because we have, you know, a 30-year history, April 1984. Um, and Seth, a, uh, a, to add to that, I think that you know, I'm a little older than you, and I would say in the beginning of my but not career, dead. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning of my career, I think it was a lot longer than it is now. Uh -huh. And I think a tip of the hat to NSDA because there's just been so much uh, work done to. So it is shorter, definitely, than it used to be. Months Still too long. I'm sorry. Months yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's good. And one sort of mini mini refinement to that is that. Um, although um, we as uh, otolaryngologists and uh, speech pathologists and scientists have a lot of familiarity with this um, in this room, and there are many others obviously, um, not every otolaryngologist or speech pathologist or scientist is going to have the same familiarity with it. Um, and so you want to be able to try to find out through community, through resources who may be able to help you a little bit better. So you have to, as, as your own self, be a, an advocate. Um, and the hardest part is finding that community. So okay. people will say, well, I went to this person and they said I have muscle tension or they gave me some Valium or they gave me you know, something and told me to go away. Yeah. And that's, that's a reasonably common phenomenon. So anyway, um, the, the, in many ways, the most satisfying part of being a clinician is being able to answer the questions um, and being able to reassure people that there are some, some solutions. Okay, Christy, and we want time for questions. We have, uh, yeah. So I'll go quick. Oh. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for an excellent summary. I thought that was very, very good. At the same time, I want to point out that we are limited in our knowledge and understanding of spasmodic dysphonia. What we've been discussing today are the symptoms. Uh, we I haven't been discussing the disorder, and we don't know where the symptoms come from and what controls those symptoms. I mean, the frustration is the variability of the symptoms, how they change, how they differ from person to person, how the treatment or treatments aimed at controlling those symptoms vary in outcome for each patient. But we haven't been addressing the disorder, which is somewhere in the brain, and it has to do with brain function and how brain function alters from time to time, can change over time. I like your evolving spasmodic dysphonia. And how different behaviors, how different manipulations of the larynx, because that's essentially what we're doing with Botox. We're manipulating the larynx. Or with surgery, we're doing the same thing. We're manipulating the larynx. But that's not where the disorder is. So I just want to remind you that we have a long way to go. <laughs> and I hope the NSDA stays around for a long time because they've got a big problem to solve. Um, it's like having people who faint every time they get up from a chair. Um, and we look at how rapidly they faint or how fast they have to get up from the chair to faint. But we never look at their blood pressure. It's the same kind of issue that we're dealing with with spasmodic dysphonia. So 
I think we've learned a lot about describing this, the symptoms and describing how to manipulate them at the larynx, but we really haven't addressed the disorder. And I th hope that in the future we can start to do that more. Perfect. Yeah. Brett. I think one of the key issues for patients with spasmodic dysphonia is that they, are, they understand the diagnosis and they understand a lot of things that Dr. Bastian just laid out, why it is that there's this variability, why it is that uh, different situations have, uh, seem to exacerbate it. And, uh, and especially with an initial patient to sit and listen to what has gone on before and what has been tried before and what your experiences are to kind of unpack that and explain that to you because it's key to have an understanding of this diagnosis. The second thing is that each patient is an individual and before treatment we have to kind of guess at what is going to be your optimum dose and so if that first dose is not a great experience for you, don't give up because optimization of treatment is really key and there really is, um, there is a right dose for you, there is a right placement for you. Um, there can be some variability, but the idea is to try to make the treatment tailored to you. It might be that you need to be injected with smaller doses over uh, shorter durations. It might be that you're one of those patients who can get an injection and go for nine months and not have any trouble. But uh, it's important to kind of stick with the treatment and, and uh, also to be interact with your physician about what are my side effects, what are the benefits, how is this helping me, and what don't I like about it? I think that's key because this is something that as yet we cannot cure, but there's excellent treatment and we can try to make things as good as possible for you. Great, great. We have a roaming mic, it looks like, or? Okay, all right, questions from? So the idea is to write them and then with these panels is we've got multiple panels today and so this one is on the overview of spasmodic dysphonia so treatment questions if you could hold those to the next panels but this is just to kind of make sure that all of your questions are answered at this symposium we find that this is always the most highly rated aspect of the symposium so that's why we kind of decided to do a, a panel presentation like this today so if and you do have questions, just hold them up and we'll start collecting them. And if you have questions for other panels, you can think about them and hold on to them until the next panel. Yeah, and the idea too is if you have a highly particular question that's very, very specific to you, better to find one of us at a break and we'll be glad to talk to you. But it, uh, questions that are of somewhat general interest would be preferred. So. I was wondering, um, I recently was reading a, a publication on the whisper dysphonia, or dystonia, and I wonder if somebody could speak to the characteristics of that particular dystonia and um, how you might manage it. I can address that. I'll be showing a video this afternoon of whispering dystonia, and you'll see that it's very different from spasmodic dysphonia. So if you come back this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know four o'clock in the afternoon is a terrible time and we're be between you and dinner, so please hang in there and come back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Question. Why is neurology not also focused on SD since it is a brain issue? Why isn't, aren't neurologists more in, uh, focused since it's a brain issue? Brent, maybe? Well, I think that's a good question, but um, as medical knowledge expands, um, even physicians in specialties become very much subspecialized. And so you find people who are most interested in things that are more common, things like stroke, things like Parkinson's disease, those kinds of things fill up the majority of the neurologist's time. And so they're interested in trying to treat patients and to look for things that are more common. Um, it's really a small number of neurologists that focus on movement disorders, and in particular, among movement disorders, dystonias. And so um, 
you know, this is something that is very real to you all because you experience it on a daily basis. But in the wide spectrum of things, because it's a rare disorder, that's the problem in uh, a lot of medical treatment and medical research is that common things are common and that's what goes on. Now, in the new medical system, I'm afraid that patients who have rare disorders are going to have to become even more of their own advocates because, again, the idea here is cost containment and uh, everyone's going to have to say, look, I have a real problem here and it deserves real treatment. There may be some difficulty ahead, I'm afraid. Okay, and uh, I think one other thing is that we have the tools to look and they don't, you know, so I think uh, that's another reason. What, um, we have a question about deep brain stimulation, but will that be covered in the surgery panel? Okay, should we hold it to, to then? Okay. I'll address it a little bit this afternoon, too. Okay. And what role does reflex play? Reflex, what role does it play? Seth? So, uh, yeah, as we all know, reflex causes everything, so. <laughs> <laughs> and we all have it. And we, and we all have it right now. It's causing, it's causing our <laughs> national to, deficit, I we think. We need to stop the panel, <laughs> run to the pharmacy. Right. <laughs> So reflux a little bit is um, uh, arguably, if you really want a controversial topic, then the can has been opened officially now. Um, that said, um, reflux is, uh, as opposed to spasmodic dysphonia, an incredibly common disorder and has, um, as opposed to spasmodic dysphonia in many ways, a sort of protean manifestations, including standard esophageal stuff, heartburn um, uh, versus uh, throat symptoms, cough, throat clear, hoarseness, trouble swallowing, et cetera. Um, so although reflux is not causative, uh, certainly for spasmodic dysphonia, it's another exacerbator. In other words, the more reflux, excuse me, you have, um, in many ways, the potential for worsening of your voice, um, particularly when it leads to chronic uh, patterns, chronic throat clear in particular, um, can almost mimic uh, muscle tension dysphonia because it contributes to this sort of hyperactive uh, upper airway, which taken to a more um, taken to more of an extreme produces can produce muscle tension dysphonia where you're always in this sort of hyperactive state, and so that can even mimic um, spasmodic dysphonia in some cases. That said, um, it's certainly an exacerbator. It makes things worse. It doesn't help, um, but it's in no way, shape, or form uh, causal. Good. Okay. Uh, maybe, Christy, I have a small comment, but what about a genetic link for dystonias? I know you've been involved in that. Well, I'll address that a little bit this afternoon, but there are uh, genetic forms of dystonia. They usually cause whole body dystonia rather than focal dystonia to the larynx. Um, there are at least three m mutations that have been found uh, to cause dystonia. Um, more than that, actually, dozens, but there are three that have been identified in the literature somewhat with voice disorders, but I'll show you that the voice disorders often in those cases are not similar to the focal spasmodic dysphonia that we're more familiar with. Okay, and why is abductor more difficult to treat? Abductor, why is that more difficult to treat? Well, abductory dysphonia um, is more difficult to treat because doing the injection is more difficult. Um, the muscles that need to be treated are behind the larynx. They're on the back. They're the, the um, posterior cricorytenoid muscles, the ones that open the vocal folds. And, and so uh, two approaches to get to. One is to turn the larynx around from the front and try to use the needle to walk up the back to find the, the muscle. And the other uh, is an approach pioneered by Dr. Bastian, again, going through the front, but going through the cartilage of the back of the larynx and getting to the muscle that way. So because treatment for spasmodic dysphonia with Botox depends in part on getting the dose to the target and getting it to a reliable place in the target, you can see how getting to the target is a real issue. That also being said, it's a little bit different in terms of its manifestations. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, a large dose of Botox when you're treating abductory um, 
you end up with the side effect of being short of breath and noisy breathing. Um, now that goes away, it's kind of obnoxious uh, if it happens, but unfortunately a degree of that is necessary to get the necessary result for the voice. Okay. Has there been any progress, probably for you, Christy, again, progress in autopsy analysis of the brain? So there are two published reports thus far of autopsy findings in spasmodic dysphonia. One identified a um, pathway in one case. It was uh, in a study on imaging but by Christina Simonon. And uh, there was one autopsy in that uh, study of a patient who had spasmodic dysphonia and found uh, some dieback of the connections between different neurons. Uh, there was another study looking at two patients, one patient with uh, voice tremor and the other with spasmodic dysphonia, finding some loss of neurons in the, in the brainstem. However, these are single cases and uh, we still need a lot more study to find out if this is simply because those particular patients had these uh, brain anomalies and it might not have had anything to do with their spasmodic dysphonia. So we still need a lot more work on brain uh, uh, pathology in patients who have had spasmodic dysphonia and well controlled um, examining people of the same age and the same health uh, to control that, with to know whether it's anything to do with the spasmodic dysphonia. Very good. Seth, uh, the question is now about the idea that specialized ENT doctors know about ST, but what about the general ENT doctors? What efforts are being made to educate general ENT doctors about this disorder? Sure. So um, that's a really excellent question. Uh, there are probably two pathways that I think um, physicians who treat spasmodic dysphonia on a regular basis will undertake. Um, pathway number one is direct contact, meaning um, the phone call to the referring physician. So if the referring physician has either neurologist, uh, you know, internist, uh, otolaryngologist, has gone to the trouble of sending you a patient and you have spent time and diagnosed spasmodic dysphonia or not. For all the neurologic voice disorders, I think that part of the phone call back to that person has to include an element of education. And so there's a, I think that honestly is part of our mandate um, as treating physicians is to educate on a person to person basis because that, it's hard to explain. I mean, not everybody can do the the voice imitations that Dr. Bastian can, but at a minimum, uh, you can at least um, begin to educate them, try to differentiate tremor from different things, what, what are we thinking about, how do we assess it, et cetera. The other part is uh, regional uh, talks. Um, so having uh, discussions at your center, reaching out to the community, um, and being able to um, give vi a lot of video examples are super duper helpful. Um, for people to be able to see it so it's not this sort of ethereal, imagined disease where you're just explaining. This is one of the reasons why I think Dr. Bastian is um, doing this because it, it makes it real. Um, so when we have videos of uh, consenting patients who are willing to have their, their videos shown, it makes all the difference in the world. So I, th I would say that you, you gotta have the phone call, make use of your iPhone or whatever it's gonna be and then also some uh, video talks are very helpful. I don't know if, that's, yes. if that answers the question. And Charlie just made a good point. He came up here and said uh, patients who are diagnosed have a major role in going back to their primary care physician and yes. letting them know, you know. So I see lots of agreement with that, sure. Okay, uh, the relationship, do we need to stop a little early because the next one stops at 4.30 or one more, okay. Uh, the relationship between age and SD, uh, the idea is why doesn't it surface in children and is there a typical age when symptoms appear and why is that? Why is there an age relationship? Who wants to take that on? Well, the focal dystonias tend to come on in midlife. The more severe dystonias, the whole body dystonias usually appear in childhood. Uh, so uh, there, it 
sort of the magic age is 45 when we think of spasmodic dysphonia. It can come on later, but usually 45 to 55 is the window when many of these disorders, vocal tremor does tend to come on sometimes later in life. Um, so there are age times, and that's one of the mysteries. Um, you know, why does the disease develop? It, the, the, uh, the risk of having that disease may exist through your lifetime, but it, the symptoms don't become manifest until 45. So average age, but can we go down the panel just quickly? Youngest you've diagnosed, oldest you've diagnosed. I mean, at age, kind of at the time of onset, onset. of symptoms. Youngest and oldest. 16 and... Uh, maybe 55. Okay. Christy, youngest, oldest? 12 and in the 80s. Okay. And Brent? I would say 22 and um, of course some patients have symptoms for a very long time. I would say probably 75. And I would say late teens and uh, uh, middle 80s maybe. Yeah. For, for the onset of symptoms. But of course it's much more common in that middle group. And then a question on potential changes in SD over time. The changes in SD over time. Uh, could I take that one? Yeah. All right. The potential changes. What happens is in uh, my experience is that once established, so there may be a several month or a six month or a year period of time when the SD is kind of finding its level. But once it's established, it's reasonably stable over time, except that the occasional person will become more severe. Uh, not the occasional, some people will become more severe, but under Botox therapy it doesn't seem to matter. But it's the people who add tremor, they, they develop increasing tremor as time goes by. Those people become a little harder to treat. And I uh, referenced earlier that there are people who change from pure AD to AD plus respiratory, or they'll go from pure AD to mixed. I've seen that. I've followed now people for 29 years or something, and so I've seen some really remarkable, like one example is a person who's been getting great results for 10 years, and I get a call saying, when will the, no, I get a call at eight weeks saying, Dr. Bastian, when will this breathiness go away? And it's like, uh-oh, they've now got abductory spasms, which they are conflating, or they're sort of thinking that's just the breathiness from the Botox, but they've actually developed. And so a few people late in their course, we have to end up doing four muscle injections rather than just two muscle injections. Can so. I add one thing to that? We've seen some patients develop more muscular tension dysphonia over time as well. They continue to have injections. The breaks are not so prominent, but they have a lot of strain over time. And I'll add, that's good, and I'll add one other thing, and that is that you find a significant number of people who've been treated for a long time with Botox who will say, uh, my SD isn't anywhere near as bad as it was. I had two people yesterday who said that. They say, you know, I used to, when I would come for my next Botox, I was just longing. I couldn't wait because it was getting so bad. And now, same interval, it's like I don't seem to, and to ever get as bad, and it's as though the baseline has changed. So, I, and sometimes they go longer between injections because instead of going halfway down to their baseline, they can go nine-tenths of the way down to the baseline because the baseline is better, you see. So you do see that. I've seen that a lot of times in long-term injected patients, quite a number of times. Could I ask a question regarding that briefly yeah. if you don't have another one lined up? <laughs> to what extent do you think that that uh, change over time is a result of the patients having such a uh, prolonged familiarity with the disease um, and almost less stress and anxiety about it and also reduce stress and anxiety given that they have confidence that they have Botox to assist them. I'm sure that's an element for some of them, but I'm talking more about people that I can personally remember. Auditory memory is not very good, but I can sometimes remember very clearly what people used to sound like, and it's sometimes provoke their question on my part, and they will say, oh yeah, it's definitely the disorder is not as severe as it used to be. So I think probably both of those teachers, when they retire, do that, where they say, well, because I don't have to dress every day for teaching, I don't have to, you know, my voice needs aren't, so they'll go longer between injections. So there is that phenomenon as well. But 
I think we probably should stop there. Thank you so much, panel. Thank you.